Up today, we're going to be speaking with the chief marketing officer of iHeartMedia, a dear friend of mine, Gail Troberman. Gail, thanks so much for joining today. Ah, it's great to be here, man. Yeah, it's yeah. great to be here at the shiny iHeartMedia podcast studio. It's If you've never been to iHeart's office, just really just a, an incredible sight uh, in terms of how they built this out, and it really is a great reflection um, uh, of the iHeart brand. Uh, we're going to quickly start by getting to know a little bit about you, Gail. Uh, sure. You were Chief Creative Officer at Microsoft from 1996 to 2012, where we were closely together, uh, and then you moved on to become Chief Marketing Ideas Officer at IPG Media Brands, and then finally, for the last seven years, you've been here at iHeart Media as Chief Marketing Officer. So tell us a little bit about your career journey and kind of the ups and downs through that? Sure. Um, I always answer this question with, you know, some people, I think particularly younger generations today are all about planning. Right? You have career plans, you have these visions, you you know, you're going to do this to get there to do this. I've always been of the um, stumble, stumble well, follow great people and what interests you. And bizarrely, that's how I, I kind of landed. Uh, I landed in advertising um, because I loved all of the TV shows about it. I thought it was fascinating, you know, be Witched to Mad Men to yeah. uh, back in the day, 30 something, and looked like a cool creative field. I had to check a box on college apps. I was like, oh, yeah, advertising. That right. sounds fun, right? And, um, and that kind of landed me in that major. Um, uh, you know, I was in. Uh, I started in the ad business in New York. Then we did a pitch. was wasn't my finest work, but um, I guess we were smart enough to not win the Microsoft business way back when in the PR days. And uh, and I met uh, Mitch Matthews and and a couple other people from Microsoft through that. And then you know, in the in the early Microsoft years, they stayed in touch and yep. they convinced me to uh, to take a big leap. Right, which was I had barely been on the internet and I was moving to see. Seattle, where I'd been once, to work on the internet and figure out initial marketing campaigns for all the internet startups at Microsoft, which and, was and crazy fun. I'm sure. Yeah, and I, yeah. I was kind of with you through some <laughs> of those trials and tribulations. I read recently that Microsoft is one of only one of the top 20 companies most valued in the world that still is one of the top 20 today um, from two decades ago. Yeah. So w given what you've experienced at Microsoft, what about that organization has have given them such staying power? Yeah, you know, um, you know, the the Microsoft culture, you know, particularly, you know, I'm obviously been been gone for a little bit of time, but it was just such a an amazing culture of um you know, make big, bold bets, resource them, um, and, you know, measure them, be willing to walk away from the ones that aren't working or don't pay off. But, you know, so much of, you know, I think in this moment of the great resignation and people changing jobs, one of the big secret secret sauces at Microsoft, and I'm sure you experienced the good and bad of this, was they, we, they just, you know, the company hired crazy, smart, passionate people yep. who were driven um, at all costs, you know, it wasn't like it wasn't an easy culture by any means. You know, it could be brutal on a any given day because everyone was so passionate and really yeah. wanted to win. And Especially during the Balmer era, right? Because yeah. things had changed. Yeah, from and what the I early hear. Bill right. era, you know, and it was a culture where you could, you know, you passionately fought for what you believed, and the people who got to decide decided, and you made the bet, and you all locked arms and played it through and, and, you know, you measured aggressively and learned. Um, but it was a culture of, you know, hiring really great people and empowering them. Right. And, I you know, I think those are core principles. You know, I know I worked for um, with Satcher very closely for a minute uh, in one of my errors there. And, you know, and, and he very much is of that, you know, Microsoft culture. It may be a little a little probably kinder and gentler than right. perhaps it right. was back in the day. Yeah. Um, but it's still about crazy, smart, passionate people, resource them, empower them, and then and hold them accountable and, and have clear and distinct goals I think yeah. Microsoft's yeah. been so laser focused on their core business lines when they veered off whether it's like with the Zune remember that or <laughs> so many products that just like didn't Windows Phone they didn't really hit they weren't afraid to shut it down and keep moving yeah and even as much working. money as it was invested in some of right. those right? right and they're really hard business decisions right it's always hard for all of us sometimes to walk away yep. yeah and, and then you moved over to IPG and <laughs> frankly I don't really remember your time at IPG how long were you there brief. for 
And what was it like? Why was it brief? Like, what was it like being on the agency side of things? Because that's yeah. It, well, it was. I think it was kind of the the best worst job offer ever, right? It was um, uh, Matt Seiler, you know, who I love, called me, and um, we had just switched agencies, so we mm-hmm. had basically just fired uh, them and and hired a publicist, yeah. and um, and uh, I had just resigned. I just left Microsoft. It was a regime change. It was time. Sure. And I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, and um, and Matt called me and he's like hey we've got this media pitch he's like you just let us go he's like we really aren't set up well for this he's like we're probably five of five in the race right now he's like what if you came and consulted and ran this giant global media pitch for us and did everything you would have bought and he's like, I'll get out of your way. We'll give you the resources. Like, come reimagine and how did that it. work out? And I was like, that's kind of crazy. And, uh, you know, there's a great story with it. My next door neighbor at the time was Ben Gibbard uh, from Death Cab for Cutie. And he had just had a big breakup with, with Zoe, Zoe. Deschanel. Yep. And, um, and we were both now suddenly home all day. And he was playing, like, three sad notes on the piano <laughs> that would ooze <laughs> into our loft. <laughs> and I was like, I got to get out of here. And so I was like, all right, I'll come consult. And... Um, and it was really fun being on the other side of a pitch. It was an amazing learning because it looks so easy when you're judging of course. versus what it takes to really restructure and reimagine integrated marketing around the globe, yep. across multiple agencies and an ecosystem. Um, and we did some really good work. You know, IPG won a, won a chunk of that business, not all of it. And so then I uh, we turned it into a real job, but it wasn't quite a clear job. So I think, you know, after a while, I had shaken things up a little bit and realized um, it's easy to judge the the agency world right. it's very hard to live it and i it think is, all clients should work yeah. at an agency before they <laughs> sit and so pitch so they know how much work goes into it and what's interesting in running an agency for so many years <laughs> is often you win business not when pitching the idea that's really best for the client but the idea that's best for the pitch mm. uh, we call it the pitch candy mm-hmm. it's like yes this idea actually will move their business but is the end buyer really motivated by long-term business success or do they just want to get in one of the trade publications Right? Yeah. Do they just want to get a promotion? Like, is there, and right or wrong, so it's true. a lot of the ways how the, the world works. And now you have true. some people at companies that really do believe in the business. But other people, it's like, am I really passionate about toothpaste? Or am I actually passionate about being able to get a promotion so I can get a bigger house for my family? Yep. And when you weigh those two things, those motivations, sometimes true. it impacts what you pitch. And it's even, you know, I, I talk about this a lot in the um, in the audio landscape today, right? Because audio, you know, radio is obviously huge, been around for a while. Um, you know, podcasting is relatively new and now there's, you know, social audio and, you know, we'll talk about, you know, we're getting into metaverse ideas and yep. things like that. And, you know, we, we've seen it through the years, you know, growing up in early digital, like there's always new shiny stuff. Of course. And I don't even know that it's as conscious for decision makers in the ecosystem, but our human bias comes into play all the time, right? It's why products like Suzy are important, right? right? To gut check our biases more frequently and faster. Because as humans, like we think the coolest idea, it may not even be as malicious as, now I want to get in the press and I'm, you know, it's honestly like, I think a lot of times it's very hard as decision makers, marketers, whether you're client side or agency or media company, like you want to do the cool stuff. Yeah. You go into marketing, not to, you know, not to crunch numbers, right? Most people go into marketing because it's kind of cool and sexy and creative. And then, you know, you want to do the new next things. And yeah, they matter. But like you said, sometimes it's the tried and true, the most efficient. We have so many clients who rely on broadcast radio because of its scale and efficiency, and it just drives growth. And you can optimize. Predictably, yeah. There's no benchmarking if you're doing something new every single time. Yeah. So the agency ecosystem, in a lot of ways, people who are so on the true. brand side sort of are coded to do those new things, to be innovative. Mm-hmm. When the reality is if you do a campaign, what you should really do is do the campaign again with the learnings that you have from the first time and keep getting better and better exactly. or whatever that thing is and you'll own that thing yeah. where a lot of times people will do oh I'm going to do a podcast that didn't work eh, let's move on to the metaverse let's move on to this it's and so then, you true. know it's, and, and because I think you know obviously we live in a world of you know instant gratification and you know big companies that report every quarter and yep. that's just kind of the world we live in and that's kind of the balancing act so and you know speaking of sort of a balancing act in the new world I mean now you are here at iHeart Media which has been kind of you know a company that 
first of all, I've always been fascinated with just because, you know, in starting Mr. Youth, you know, MTV was sort of like the <laughs> company and Bob Pittman started MTV and I was followed his career so much through the years. And then once he came here and kind of created this new conglomerate, iHeart, I really had my eye on it. And then you joined <laughs> and I had, you know, even um, a greater interest in the company. Tell us a little bit about your journey here at iHeart. Sure. Um, it, it was another one of those great job offers that wasn't a job offer. Um, you know, I love a good challenge. And um, I had met Bob when I was at IPG. Mm -hmm. And um, he called me one day. And I'd, again, I was sort of between things. I was going to take the summer off, chill on the island in the Northwest, figure out my life. You know, someday I'll get to that. Yeah. And um, and he called me and he goes, hey, I, you know, I just start, took over here as CEO at what was then Clear Channel. And he said, you know, I kind of have this, this crazy idea. I want to float it by you. I'd love to pick your brain and he's like you know I'm thinking like we need to reimagine the company and the brand and I'm thinking maybe we should change the name of the company and really rebrand from Clear Channel to iHeartMedia and he's like we've got the iHeartRadio app and the iHeartRadio brand and it's really catching and he's like you know and he walked me through kind of his initial thinking and he's like so he's like I'll call you at the same time tomorrow he's like you know G give me a day of your brain and see what you think about it and then I called him did some work we the next day I talked to him and and it was it's kind of what I uh, what I love about iHeart and you know Microsoft had become very big and deliberate and and you know with, with a lot at stake globally yeah. and we'd become slower um, and Bob and you know one day he's like yeah I thought about that we debated it and he's like I think I'm gonna do it he's like will you come figure this out for me he's like I'm gonna get everyone all of my leadership team in a room on Monday, and this was like a Friday, right. and he's like, and we're gonna go through a list of every decision, every place our brand appears and what we do. Keep it, change it, get rid of it. Wow. And we went through a spreadsheet of thousands and thousands of line items as a leadership team, made every decision ballpark costs what is it the sign on top of the building the billboard here the elevators in these offices every single place the brand appeared and we made a decision boom and we rebranded the company in something like i think six weeks and that that's how brands are made and right? it was super every fun every detail yeah. matters they talk about yeah. how people answer the phone or what the business cards and every little touch point becomes the brand and you, sometimes you have to get in the weeds yeah and, exactly and, and and knowing you i know that you like you know, being strategic, but you also like getting your hands dirty. You like yeah, to I like a line job because yeah. it's where you learn, right? Of you know, like you don't want to do it every day, but you got to get in. Particularly, I think when things are new, 100%. right? You got to get in the weeds. You know, one of the the questions you had asked me was like one of those big, you know, big learning moments. And when I first took over advertising for the whole company at Microsoft, one of the like. It, it blew people's minds, and to me it was the simplest thing in the world, was there'd been uh, sort of the agencies of record pitching one big, massive, important B2B campaign for 18 months. They just kept coming in, and nothing was landing, and they right. go, go back, go back to the drawing board, and we just weren't marketing like right. in a big above the line way and um and i just started and it was like my first week and you know so they brought in some new agencies and the existing agency and they did a pitch and the existing agency stuff was fine and it was kind of like we have to go to bill and steve and everybody on like tuesday so i guess we should go with that and i was like but there's genius over here and this other idea and was they're like crisp, oh yeah but that crispin border Is that, uh, that was no was? it was actually jwt oh wow okay. it was uh, it was the b2b campaign gotcha. for the, okay. the corporate Right. you know all of our business products right and um, and I was like but there's this genius but and they're like oh but it's not right for us and they don't get us and it's too off and I was like but we have a whole weekend and um and I remember talking to the you know Mitch the CMO at the time and I was like well what if I got in a plane and went and worked with them all weekend Monday we'll come back and if we're there great we can bring both ideas and if we're not there no harm we'll go with the you know the the okay the idea, right? And I was like, you know, and I'm so glad I did it. You know, it's funny. I'm still what great friends with Rose and Ty, right, and Rose and Ty like you know, yeah. and like, but the thing that you know, it, you know, it, it, I see a lot in my career, and a lot of the best moments I've had is we broke down the walls between agency and client. They let me into the workroom. We right. stayed up till midnight, two in the morning. You know, then they'd be like, "Go away and come back at eight a.m. and then rip it apart and then give us some time." And we worked 
together for 72 hours. And that's, I mean, that is how. That's how it should be, how right? How it should be. I mean, we talk about a lot the hippo, which is the highest paid person's opinion. And <laughs> my experience is like agency goes behind these walls and they come up with this incredible idea or what they think is incredible. And then they pitch the hippo. And during the meeting, the hippo shows up late. Sometimes they're on their phone, which is to drive me crazy, is right? He, oh, yeah. And ultimately, it's like your champion's like, I don't know, it matters what the hippo said, whoever that is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times their decision isn't made on data. It could be based on what their daughter told them when they were dropping them off at school or a TV show they heard. And that's going to basically jade their opinion in a certain direction, which may or may not be right for the business, but there's no data behind that decision. Exactly. You know, and I think that's the, the challenge we all have with creative ideas, yep. right? That's why creative testing, I think, is so interesting, right? It's, Absolutely. It's such an interesting space. We're doing more and more of it with audio. We're trying to do more and more of it with you guys in audio. Yeah. Because, yeah, I think, you know, just getting a gut check. Like, testing doesn't tell you all the answers, but it, it prevents the disaster. And it, sometimes it helps you find a, a spark of genius you might have missed. Absolutely. I've, I'm often asked, what's the ROI of research? I'm like, well, what's the ROI of a seatbelt? <laughs> right? It only matters if, if you if really it matters. need it. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so we're going to get into our next section mm -hmm. um, called Culture Watch. Uh, as you know, this podcast is called The Speed of Culture. And Suzy is a tool that really enables insights and research at The Speed of Culture. And we're going to ask you a couple questions, one of which you've already answered. So we're going to jump into the next three. In classic <laughs> Gail Trodeman <laughs> form, she's making her rules up as we go along. And I can roll the punches. So I'm going to ask you three questions. And cool. we'll touch upon the one that you just answered as well. Cool. And just answer quickly. Um, um, in 30 seconds, um, you know, how you feel about this particular topic, and then we'll dive in. So question number one is, what do you think the fastest growing industry will be in the next few years and why? Uh, sure. You know, I mean, I think um, audio is growing crazy fast, right, on a huge base, which is kind of the exciting part of it. Obviously, I'm a little biased. Of course. <laughs> um, but, um, but you know, broadcast radio is still reaching 9 out of 10 Americans because wow. it's live and it's right. human and it's unscripted. And it's not just a place to hear music. It's a place to actually have a conversation and not be alone. Yep. It's a really bizarre business most people don't understand. So that's why, you know, I think with all, you know, with the world's music in my hand right now on this phone, um, you know, we've certainly seen people listen in their cars, they listen on their smart speakers, they listen on their laptops, on their phones, on their watches, on their TVs. But we're seeing listening continues to grow and to more types of content. Yep. And I think in this moment where, you know, I think the promise of digital was it was going to unite us all in a kumbaya, lovely, the world is connected. And God, what we're seeing is the opposite, yep. right? It's brought out our worst selves. It's it's become a place that makes you feel worse, not better. And, you know, I think that's why you're seeing a lot of content that's live and human, um, companionship conversation media seems to be growing everywhere and I think that's why we're seeing this massive new podcast rocket ship grow yeah right podcasting is really similar you know it's it's human it's mostly human and unscripted the other thing you know I think that that's fueling audio growth particularly podcasting growth is um I think, you know, and, and you were kind of way ahead of the understanding millennials, right, with mm -hmm. Mr. Youth back in the day, right? I think we really as marketers missed, and, and most content companies misunderstood millennials, right? We kept talking about short attention spans, but we forgot we were talking about the most curious, interested, educated generation connected in the too. US, connected and educated and interested, yep. right? So we were going, oh, 140 characters, you can only handle 15 seconds of my advertising. And yet they're listening to three hour podcasts about of revisionist course. They're history. They're binge watching 20 shows on Netflix. Exactly, row, entire right? seasons right. Of, of smart, interesting content. So, you know, that's why I think podcasting has really filled a void, particularly for that millennial audience, right? Who are smart and interested and curious. So Absolutely. I think we're gonna see audio growth just just continue and and wireless headphones now your ears are connected to the grid yeah so think about that we were consuming most all our content through our eyes and now our ears are connected yep so it's at, like I mean, extra bandwidth i mean people think yeah. airpods are going to be the future of the smartphone yeah and you know it's it's a one wearable device that's really taken on in a true utilitarian way Exactly. For consumers, I mean, I forget they're in my ears. I wear them the entire day, and it creates yeah. such utility I never thought, and it's all based on audio. Yeah, exactly, so. exactly. So that's why, you know, I think audio is, is destined for continued growth and sustainability, but most marketers don't understand much about yeah, it. So exactly. that's the opportunity. Uh, what do you think will be the fastest-growing product uh, or product category in the next few years? 
Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I think the obvious answer of the week has to be metaverse. But what that means, right. I think it's, you know, it's like saying Internet back in the you know mid 90s. What, what exactly does that mean? I think we're all in a learning phase. Um, at iHeart, we've made some announcements. Um, we're going to take um, a lot of the success we've had in our events business. So we do, you know, hundreds, uh, hundreds of events from, you know, the big jingle balls to yep. small local events, music events, concerts. Um, and we're going to start bringing events into the metaverse so we can connect fans and artists um, and uh, brands in some new ways. And we're going to start learning. So we're going to go where consumers are. We've announced we're going to go into Roblox. We'll be creating iHeartLands, where um, now we can bring, you know, without all the physical world costs, right, right, of what it costs to put on a giant festival or a live event in the real world, I think we can do even more interactive and more engaging opportunities that bring the fan closer and closer to the artist. And the community and around the And the community, artists. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And I know we were talking just before this interview <laughs> just about, and, and this was your answer for the fast growing consumer trend, you talked about basically the connection of real world and um, digital. And yes. I, w I was talking to Rich Kleiman, another person who we interviewed for the podcast who runs 35 Venture and Kevin Durant's uh, business partner. And he said the same thing. Mm -hmm. He basically said, you know, and, and, and you guys both share that you guys play in the entertainment world, him more in the mm -hmm. sports, although he does in music and you in music. And there's this notion of being able to go to a physical event, being able to experience in the metaverse or digitally, being able to buy tokens that kind of get you access to both, that mm -hmm. there's something there that's gonna be unlocked that's going to be transformational and the question is when's it going to come out what is it going to be how's it going to be adopted etc yeah yeah exactly and it, you know i mean creatively it's just you know in the virtual world like who knows uh, you know i think everything's possible i think blockchain commerce is going to be real but you know and i think we're learning fast on the nft space that's the other place we've been dabbling you yeah know? so when you go to an iheart event you know you want to engage with the event and you know a simple thing like a qr code who would have thought qr code Crazy. Would be would become so important. Well, the pandemic, really right? But they're that, so right? accessible. Yeah. Now that we know how to grab menus, menus right? Right. We were shocked. We did. Um, we did our first sort of um, uh, QR code level, lev uh, sort of uh, virtual upgrades, rewards, experience, loyalty program at the iHeartRadio Music Festival last fall. And you know, at the daytime stage, where all the like hottest pop stars who were just breaking sure. um, are there, and it's tons and tons of teens. I was shocked. Right. People entered they walked through like a qr canyon they did all their step and repeat pictures on their way into the venue and about two-thirds of the attendees grabbed the code to enter to win upgrades to get free stuff from brands to get a meet and greet with one of the artists so all of a sudden you know what used to be like somebody on a mic trying to scream from the stage into a loud arena and crowd yeah. now everybody can engage and participate in that show and, and that access. experience we have a two-way communication going now at scale yep with a simple thing like a qr code and so. that is such a sea change from yeah. when we were growing up it's like if you, whatever you want to hear, you either have to buy the cassette tape for twenty dollars and beg your parents for it, <laughs> or tw whatever Clear Channel or whatever it was called before that was playing on heavy rotation, yeah. and and that was it. Like yeah. you didn't really have the choice at all. And now it's the complete opposite, right? And there's just limitless choice. And within that limitless choice, you have communities where you feel comfortable and you feel this artist represents who I am. Exactly. And if you can, they're layer, tribes, right? Yeah, they're tribes, right? Yeah. And if you can layer and podcasts, I would argue is another you know mm -hmm. point. Of that and I think if you can layer on top some type of currency, mm -hmm. you know, currency, community, content, accessibility all together, then you have people that basically are getting such value um, in an area where they feel connected in this world that's become increasingly polarized. It's so true. Like the you know, when we do so much work with the artists, their fan armies are insane. I know. And right. and you're right when you say podcasting, because like a super fan of stuff you should know, right? They they listen to every episode over and over again. They subscribe, they follow, they show up at live events, right? The podcasters are becoming the rock stars building these new communities of listeners. It's and, so true. And it's so different than like, you know, those of us who might be like watch a, a movie or a, a TV. TV series like there is something about the the connectedness of these like audio tribes and they want more right they're like rabid and so that's where things in the virtual world right become so exciting absolutely yeah, yeah. I was in Las Vegas for a Philadelphia Eagles game and I li I'm a huge fan and I was I listened to this podcast that a couple guys do about the team and I was with my friends in Las Vegas and 
I like all of a sudden got starstruck for, with this random <laughs> middle aged dude. And yep. I like ran away from my friends. They're like, who is that? I'm like, oh, he's the host of my favorite Eagles podcast. Yep. And they were making fun of me, right? But <laughs> no, you know, it's so you think I was running towards like Michael Jordan. But you feel like you know those people, oh, right? 100%. Like a lot of our um our broadcast radio personalities too, they always say it like, you know, people ask Ryan Seacrest all the time, like, dude, like, you know, you're an idol and you got your own morning show and why do you get up every morning and do three hours of live radio? Like it's a hard gig. Right. And he's always like, because those fans keep me real. Yeah. So they're like, you know, I'll be he'll be standing with Katy Perry and people will come up trembling like, Katie, can I get a picture? And they'll be like, Oh, Ryan, would you take it? How's that cold you had? Right. Right. And they feel like they know these people. It's like the intimacy is right? so different in audio, I think, than the artifice of of sort of screens and video. Yeah. Yeah. I want to wrap with one point that you sure. were talking about earlier in terms of so you flew to New York to meet with Ty and Rosemary, who are two great <laughs> creatives. Yes. Um, who are at JWT and then went to go found their own agency. Um and you, there's something about this idea that you loved, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a safe idea. And ultimately, like in our industry, everyone throws around the word insights, right? Yes. Insight this, insight that. <laughs> but to me, you know, an insight is something that like, to me, the most insightful person ever is Jerry Seinfeld, right? You, look at, <laughs> you watch all the shows and the, the humor was from that, whatever that one funny insight was. It's or, so like, people true. Are quiet on it was an observation, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, and it's yeah. like it's an insight that hits with people. It strikes a chord inside them and makes you really want to open your eyes to whatever story they're trying to tell. Was that is that why you thought it was special? Exactly, and the you know the we we did end up working with JWT on that campaign, um, and we ended up winning a Can Lion for that campaign. It was a B two B campaign, um, and the insight was was really simple. The world was changing because of technology, and all of the different siloed divisions of a company were finally going to have to work together, right? And this is going back, you know, whatever, 10, 12 right. years ago, right? Um, but the marketing and IT, right? Tearing and down the Yeah, and the CEO and HR, and all of a sudden technology was bringing these people together to force them to make decisions, to plan, to communicate. And, and the, that was the insight, like we have to break down these these walls. And, um, and the campaign was called Because It's Everybody's Business. Yeah. Right? That. And when everyone is a stakeholder, you think about things really differently, right? And it was a genius campaign. It was also beautifully done, but it was really hearing from those different sides of the business. And those were conversations that weren't happening. Right. They were very, very siloed, and right. we kind of gave voice to them at the scale of national media yep. in a really unique way. And yeah. often, you know, to wrap this, like often mm -hmm. the insight, a great insight flies in the face of a shiny object. So right? true. Like, yep. So like the idea is not the medium. The idea is the insight yeah. and what you build on it. And then it could be Don't executed. buy the thing, right. right? Have an insight, understand something about your customers, right. and then figure out which things deliver on right. that insight, right? But yeah. And, that, and that's yeah. hard work. That, it is. Anything it that's is. hard work, people will skip over to the fun stuff. Yeah. It's just that's how they are, and, and that's why I think you see a lot of not great work out there, companies that don't know how to continue to build their brand, et cetera. Um, you know, it's definitely an opportunity. So this has been amazing. Awesome. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. One final question I have for you is, you know, in a fast place world and you're going East Coast, West Coast and running around with iHeart, what do you feel is worth slowing down for for you? What's what slows Gail Troberman down? <laughs> what slows me down? Age. Um, <laughs> Um, other than that, you know, I think one of the things, you know, COVID was such a learning moment for all of yeah. us as humans, right? Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, I got back into was just, I think, some of the amazing content um, that's out there. Yep. So, like, you know, you were talking about the ability to just slow down and actually watch a f great film, yeah. right? Actually pay attention and watch, not multitask, but actually stop yep. and consume really quality content. So that's something I, you know, I want to keep doing. And, and similar on the life side, like, you know, I think, you know, we say we all missed human contact and connection. Like, I think what we really, like, at least in our lives, what we missed so much wasn't like all the travel and the giant events and stuff. They're fun. But like what I missed was just like a few friends and a great meal and yeah. that conversation. And we're really trying to keep that and bring that back. Just, yeah. Right. Just people you love at a dinner table, having a meal and a conversation Absolutely. and making time for that. Yeah. You know, that's that's, that's the most important thing. So to wrap things in our last episode with Rich Kleiman, partner and co-founder of 35 Ventures, we talked about how brands should partner with influencers to create content. 
Um, and Rich wanted to know if consumers thought that influencers should be more like rent an ambassador for a brand or if they should be kind of there for the long term. Because mm. what we find a lot is that brands kind of stick to um, influencers for a short period of time and go on to the next thing. And they don't really mm -hmm. be connected the same way that maybe Michael Jordan was connected to Nike. And, mm -hmm. you know, so. But what we actually found is that some consumers actually thought about a quarter, thought that um, influencers should stick with brands for a short period of time, and others should be for the long period. So kind of indifferent there, but that was a great question, uh, Rich. But while we have you, Gail, mm -hmm. what is one question you want to ask consumers on the Suzy platform about anything that we touched upon today? Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm obviously passionately curious about all things audio. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to learn more from consumers about, um, you know, and I have kind of my theories and certainly a bunch of our own research, but I'd love to hear more from consumers about, you know, why they listen, right? Why, why they, you know, why they listen, um, and you know, why they listen to different types of content. Like, I'd love to get to that idea of, do you listen to be connected, do you listen to not be alone? Right. Right. Are you listening for the content itself, for the ideas? Are you listening to learn, to be entertained? You know, I I think it's it's really interesting to keep understanding why why people connect to to audio in a different it's way, so and it impacts our brain differently. So the more insight I get about that, the better we are at iHeart. Yeah, and talking about consumer insights, yeah. I mean, since we, Susie mm -hmm. has not had an offense since the middle of the pandemic, although we get together as much as we can, but when I'm at home, in my home office working, and it's completely quiet, I cannot work. Yeah, so it's I need bizarre, to put right? something on <laughs> yeah. just so I, and that gets me in sort of a flow state. So yep. I think for me, for some people, audio is distracting. If, if they're multitasking, for me, it kind of turns my engine on. Yeah, it's like kind of what's the role of audio in your life, right? right like, right. you know, and well, we will definitely yeah. dig in. Yeah. Well, Gail, Killer. this is as expected, this has been amazing. So awesome. I just want to thank you again. Also, thank you for being a huge part of Susie's journey and success, being a member of our board of directors since really the beginning. And it's been uh, incredible to work alongside you, and we wouldn't be where we are today without you. So thank Thank you for that. Awesome. And, uh, and, and this, should be, this should be great. I'm really excited for our audience to hear this. So on behalf of me, the entire C uh, team at Suzy and Adweek, um, I just want to thank everyone for joining. Until next time, we'll see you on the Speed of Culture podcast. Take care, everyone.